this episode, I'm joined by Seth and Patrick from Local Matters, the localist organisation, to discuss their new localist manifesto. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Matrix or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Okay, so I'm here with um, Patrick and Seth from Local Matters Publishing, who we're going to discuss localism and their recent publication of the localism manifesto um so welcome both of you to the podcast and thanks for coming thank you on. very much for having us hey, yeah. um but I, I was actually just saying to patrick i always put this in the questions but i actually forgot to include it this time the first time i forgot to include it unfortunately i always have a question unique to this podcast that i ask before jumping in with the you know the topic at hand which is the hermetics question um so i guess I understand this will now be off the top of your head. So from both of you, um, if you could place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on the conversation, uh, who would you pick? Ooh, um, I'm happy to go first on that if you want. <laughs> yeah, you're going to take all the good ones, aren't you? Go on then. <laughs> ones that are big to me. So my favorite thinker of all is John Papworth, who's not particularly big or well-known, but uh, reasonably well-known in England. But he was a uh, Church of England vicar who went against the church in terms of quite a few things. He used to talk to his parish about uh, global crises facing the world. So he'd be talking about environmental crisis. He'd be talking about um, economic crises within the country. Um, And there's a lot of articles on him that name him as a turbulent priest. Uh, He eventually, it all culminated when he stole from Tesco and uh, claimed it's not a sin to steal from Tesco because it's not actually a part of the neighborhood. Uh, So you're not really taking from an individual you're actually just redistributing wealth into a much needed place so i I always find him an interesting one um and he used to talk with uh leopold core um and schumacher and it's all about the philosophy of small and it's that kind of thing that would definitely be of interest to us as localists as thinking about smaller systems and decentralization so seeing those two together, but actually for a mix after that, I would definitely want someone pre-modern. I would definitely want someone from the ancient world, like, uh, for instance, Aristotle to be talking to them, because I'd love to see the melding of people who are from a post-modern era talking to people from pre-modern era. So I think that would be the one for me. Don't know about you, Patrick. Yeah. So as I said, Seth's sort of taken the words right out of my mouth. I think Leopold Kaur, Schumacher, and then Papworth sort of being a little bit on on the uh, periphery, but definitely still really important. Uh, you know, those sort of three thinkers are really the key um, ideological backing behind uh, at least where we sort of started to discuss what localism really was, at least to us, and, and what really got us onto to making the book itself. Um, if I had to add anybody else, um, I think to uh, really big figures I'd want to add. And, and they're not really as much thinkers, but certainly um, have offered a lot to us in terms of, of the work that we do and, and certainly helped inspire the book itself um, as well is Abby Hoffman and uh, Sergei Popovich, who uh, both were activists. Hoffman was uh, really popular in America. He uh, was really big in sort of those sort of hippie movements and led a lot of really, really interesting and and sort of kooky movements to do a lot of really really dodgy stuff around the time of the vietnam war um but actually had a lot of really strong ideological backing around uh you know sort of the necessity of activism the necessity of bringing forth these sort of radical and and sort of groundbreaking at the time uh political ideas and sort of shaking up the status quo um and Sergei popovich as well was also an activist and what he did was he he uh led a group called optor in serbia and uh initially at least in serbia and uh he he used non-violent activism there to essentially help to depose serbia's dictator and he talks a lot about different methods that he used after that fact uh and during to to help uh topple dictatorships around the world and, and bring forth democracy and it goes into a lot how you can use you know things such as humor and uh you know creating these sort of more um characterized figures of these dictators or whatever else to, to actually achieve a lot of political impacts that people might otherwise think could only be achieved through violence or even through a party political machine there's a lot that can be done through um sort of what we'd call metapolitics so those those are two figures that I definitely include as well as as, as obviously um, Core Schumacher and Papworth. I mean, just focusing on Core Schumacher and Papworth, do you think there'd be any major disagreements with the three, or do you think they'd 
largely be on the same lines? They're largely on the same lines. Um, so that's why it would be not not the most interesting of discussions in terms of disagreement at all. But I would love to see those minds melded together because they came at the philosophy of small in some ways from different points of view. Papworth very much does focus on Christianity and not necessarily Christianity, but any religion's role in a smaller community. Um, whereas core is much more about the function, the very specific functionality that occurs when numbers get too high or aggregates of people are too high. And it's almost down to a science. Um, whereas Papworth in his books doesn't really have many uh, much statistical data. And he says that outright in one of his chapters in Village Democracy, he says, you might notice I haven't really used any statistical backing here. And he lists a few people that he says have done that already. And you, their work is there to be looked at. He said, you know, what interests me far more is finding out um, and taking this journey through my life to figure out what can change socially and what we can figure out as a people together on a smaller scale. So th there's still discussion to be had there. There's very much one, one is more emotive and one is more um, systems thinking. They definitely all bring their own sort of uh, unique twang to, to the discussion and they all do have their own sort of primary interests and, and things which about these small systems they, they sort of prioritise. Um, and that sort of mimics, you know, really what we have in Local Matters as well and, and, and sort of the minds that came together to write the book. Um, you know, we have people who are really interested in economics, we have people who are really interested in talking about uh, agriculture and hydroponics. Um, so it was all these sort of different perspectives, albeit on the same page, but still from very different perspectives with different backgrounds um, that, that really allowed us to write the book. And I think seeing um, sort of the, the, the ideological backing and the founders of these sort of ideas in, in Core Schumacher and Papworth offer their own insights and, and be able to speak in that sort of open forum would be uh, absolutely fantastic. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, as you say, these are three, three of the major influences for the for the book i'm sure they will come back in um um and this is one of the cases with one of these discussions where i actually have like uh, an extremely clear question to just ask you i mean with a lot of the with a lot of topics that uh, i discuss on here i can't say right can you just define that but uh, i feel with localism actually the this this i'm not a fan of manifestos generally but actually mm. this one was pretty pretty succinct pretty articulate pretty watertight and it wasn't uh very egotistical so it avoided most of the the trappings that manifestos fall into um but i will just throw the question out there how do you uh define localism um localism for us always comes about putting the community um as a political or economic system first as an entity in itself so it sort of came from there and we expanded out from there. So we would argue that it is definitely about having power forms be bottom up as opposed to top down. Um, so through local community as the most important political and economic entity, you would be putting those things first with your, you know, with forms of direct democracy straight to the people, right down to the village level and then branching upward from there because it comes down to the core idea that a nation is nothing but a community of communities. Um, so, which is very much a sort of a Peter Krop Kropotkin type idea. Um, but, you know, it, it is only going to be the sum of its parts. Um, so that's how we would define it really, is changing that power to be bottom up. Apart from that, uh, we don't really like to claim it to be in any form of way reactionary, but we would easily explain it as the opposite of globalization as well, where globalists would seek to centralize control of market forces and governments. Localists instead would seek to transfer that control straight to the source, the community, the worker, the people. So it's a worldview that acknowledges that people and places matter. Okay. 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 I mean, I have an immediate question on that, but I have actually skipped over something, which is kind of important. Why, uh, how did this manifesto come about? Why, why, why now? You know, there, there was, uh, I believe, was it five five authors for this? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the manifesto and local matters itself really are, um, you know, two sides of the same coin. Uh, after, you know, we'd started on our journey of delving into these ideas of this small versus big axis, this idea of centralization versus decentralization, um, you know, we started to sort of, 
drift away from the very stereotypical political discussions of left versus right, socialism versus capitalism, all these very, very uh, prolific debates that are currently raging on at the minute and, and sort of saw that a lot of, you know, the problems and a lot of the, the changing tides in terms of uh, politics in the 21st century really revolve around this idea of scale and power and where that power is based. So be that the Brexit referendum or the increase in separatist movements, be it in Scotland, be it in Catalonia, uh, I mean, even in Texas as well, um, there is a sort of growing interest in this idea of, of centralization versus decentralization and the importance of, of these small ideas. So the manifesto sort of came about in the sort of looking at this idea of this big versus small axis and trying to really map down how this idea of trying to create a smaller system and the benefits to this smaller system would work in all these different areas. So obviously the book covers a vast array of topics. It goes from economics to identity to politics, uh, all quite quickly and succinctly. But the, the main sort of purpose of the book in that sense is to really tie all these different ideas together in this context of small systems and why small systems work better. So it, it really came about in a, a sort of desire to to really create a definitive idea of this broader idea of localism, which which isn't really an original term. It's been a term that's been sort of thrown around for quite a while now uh, and, and is being increased in usage to this day. Uh, even I think Russell Brand recently talked about localism, although there's, there's that sort of lack of, of broader uh, ideology surrounding this this big and small divide so that's really what we wanted to do we wanted to cement that not only for ourselves so we could sort of better understand the bigger picture of these ideas and the thinkers of core schumacher papworth and whoever else and look at these their ideas rather than isolation and unity uh, and then also hopefully uh demonstrate to other people as well you know the benefits of these ideas and try and share localism with other people and, and hopefully um uh, guide uh, the UK, England, elsewhere towards uh, smaller systems because we ultimately believe that's that's the sort of best path for the 21st century and, and the sort of crises that we're facing at the minute. Okay, okay. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump back and already play devil's advocate with this. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm fully inspired. I come from small communities. I come from a rural area where the the kind of things that are being you know this is why it's actually quite surprising to me i sort of went into this i'll be honest with you i went into this like oh, manifesto i'm already quite suspicious but actually i was like by the end of it i was like okay these guys i'm you know the the this is this is fairly like not as i said not egotistical and fairly articulate um and, so, and, and as someone from a rural background where you know in the in the space of like 20 years i've witnessed a very small nice community basically just turn into you know suburbia light mm. um this you know this is something i can support but my big question with these things is as you say with that kropotkin analysis of a community of smaller communities what is stopping uh, a, a smaller group of people or one person within a community once you have established this localist foundation to develop it into something bigger you know how do you draw the line where that doesn't turn into a form of authoritarianism um, I think really what you have to understand is is that localism is is not this sort of um, and I'm not saying you're assuming this but um, is, is it's not this sort of very idealized let's all go back to living in in small villages and, and rural communities and as much as you know we sort of even like to sort of idealize that idea localism very much also works within a city environment it works within all these sort of developed you know 21st century and beyond settings and that really is the environment in which it was created for um but in terms of not only just development but in terms of of how localism can apply and and prevent additionally sort of a, a, a moving away from itself a shift towards authoritarianism I think really it is the attachment that people will have to that sense of agency that they've lost, especially within the first few generations of, of localism once it had been implemented. If you, you know, imagine the role that you might have felt within, you know, your own community, your own town, even your street uh, growing up, uh, you know, that sense of community spirit is something that's often talked about, that feeling of, of a responsibility of a role within your own sort of personal setting, your little bubble. Um, and, and recently, as government has become more centralized, as, you know, we've started to see our community more of an extension of the state rather than actually, you know, our surroundings and, and an entity within of itself. Um, you know, there is this this 
change really and this this feeling of community spirit has has declined but as it would reintroduce itself through the introduction of direct democracy and um changing economics as well which i'm sure we'll get into later um that feeling of purpose and that feeling of value in the community uh will really tie people down to the idea of localism and we really think that ultimately uh once people have that feeling of agency the feeling that they can change things within their community the feeling that they're part of some sort of greater whole uh, people will get very attached to that because it's if you think about history in a very broad uh, sense, how things have been done through most of history. This sort of idea of centralized government is a, is a very recent one. Um, and it's it's not necessarily, um, you know, we don't believe in a linear view of history. We don't believe in an end of history. And we certainly think that something like that, uh, at least in terms of community spirit, could quite easily be brought back into the 21st century. And, and if it was, um, it would be quite hard to shake it again. Um Certainly be... something I'd like to add there, Patrick, is yeah, democracy is both a means and an end. Yeah. And it's something we put forward in the book. And I think it's something that is a bit of a motto for local matters. But I think a lot of the control will come from the people being bottom up. That's exactly it. So um, if you look at uh, the Mondragoon Corporation, um, the way they work as an example is their manager is elected. It's a democratized workplace. The manager has to get reelected. And so far it has been stopping any form of corruption, any form of bullying within the company, because managers quite simply can't. When there is a small enough aggregate that have control of you know, the, the people above them, there is an understanding amongst each other. If you get a small enough state, no leader who is truly corrupt or evil can truly stand up to the people um, because it's too small for people to not see those issues occur. They're going to be noted and they're going to be noticeable. If you look at like a small community, if it was managing its own healthcare, it's certainly going to start caring about preventative forms of healthcare when it cuts into a smaller budget on that small scale. They're going to see the need to educate people on preventative healthcare, like eating healthily to not get obese, for example. Um, so I think democracy is both a means and an end. It's a strong part of how we seek to prevent authoritarian forms coming in from above. Mm, for sure. And I think as, as well, it's, you know, localism doesn't entrench itself. And and if there was, you know, one sort of prolific figure within a community, within a, a group of communities who, uh, you know, did in many ways lead the discussion and influence the direction of those communities, if that was the general will of the people, then that, that should be applied um you know we we aren't sort of imposing localism as this sort of end of history this sort of perfect idea we understand that the situation and the requirements of any community and of any period in history or the future uh, are going to be their own so we we facilitate and understand that sometimes you know you might have a local system which is more authoritarian you might have a local system which is more socialist more capitalist you know it isn't as binary as, as you know the sort of existing ideologies which were popularized in the 20th century which are very be all and end all because they are you know top down and you have to have a very rigid structure for that to happen whereas localism can be you know a lot more um moldable to whatever situation a community finds itself in and there's debate within the group even between that because you said like one place could be more capitalist um two of us in the group who wrote the book don't believe that at all um but other members do think that you can still have certain elements like small private business um in the far off future still then there's a couple of us who think you cannot we think it all has to be democratized so there's even discussion on that still within the movement yeah i mean i was gonna jump in there and say like i'm i'm with uh seth on this um and i'm not really of any political uh strain but capitalism is inherently something that will just expand if you let it to leave it to a sort of breed so that would you know that that would be my something that i would put in there is it that how can you stop a, a single locality if they decide to be capitalist or some other ideology which seeks to grow um, which many do how can you stop them sort of infiltrating into another locality that's it. Mm. always yeah. a difficulty so I, uh, for like um, Liam and I, one of the other writers, um, our opinion is uh, that, yeah, democratization of the workplace um, or democratization of small business. We understand that a tiny little cafe might well be able to run with just one bloke in charge because it might well work and be a deserved hierarchy. Um, he may have, you know, worked in cafes for a lot longer than anyone else in the CAF. Um, but certainly, yeah, we, we do see the need to stop that infinite growth in its tracks. Um forgot what I was going to add on to that, to be honest. 
but yeah, so I don't know. Uh, we certainly do seem to be looking more down the roots of that. We are going to expand on the economic section in the future, we think, because again, it's something we're still learning and tackling because we all came much more from an emotive or political viewpoint, first of all, um, or a philosophical point of view, and then came to economics as more of a necessity for, of course, it's something we have to consider and of course, it's something we have to move forward with. But one argument I will give that is uh, just very much more personal or anecdotal is locally we had a cafe seeking to expand in my community and it was stopped in its tracks by the people we had a large survey go out there was 2000 people um signed up to stop the growth and it, it does give you that faith that actually people do have a stopping point if it's on a small enough aggregate locally people didn't want the expansion of this cafe it's a nice cafe but it wanted to go into what is currently essentially common land so people do have their stopping point. And I think often when people think, well, people would be voting for more capitalism, I don't think they would. Once it's in their backyard, uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, not in my backyard thinking, of course. And I honestly think that a lot of that expansion will stop naturally once people have that control and agency over it. Yeah, it certainly depends on the industry. I think Mondragon's a really good uh, example of that as well, which you raised earlier. It's um, you know, uh, it's a democratically ran business essentially, um, and that's that's based in in Spain. But it's certainly something that can be applicable here. I mean, there's the co-op which sort of runs like that as well. Um, but when you're talking about these bigger companies, where that sort of capitalist idea of you know infinite untamed growth uh, and that sort of desire for profit as the driving force behind uh, society. Um, are really sort of seen to its fullest. It's it's in those larger industries, larger conglomerates. Whereas, as as Seth said quite rightly, you know, a, a mom and pop cafe isn't going to really be um, doing too much harm to its community and growing to such an extent that it becomes an issue. And if it did, of course, with the prioritization and the, the focus of of democracy uh, within localism, it would be you know any economic form, be it more private ownership, be it a very dem um, democratically organized corporation, would be always beholden to um the actual force and the will of direct democracy as well as well as any other you know policy that we'd have in place we've talked about guilds in the book as well as a, a stop gap between um the betterment of the community versus um you know the necessities of corporations so there's lots of systems in place because we understand that capitalism itself is uh you know the other half to the problem really that the first one being uh, the actual liberal political system but capitalism is is really a massive part of the issue and you know tackling the faults of capitalism is a lot easier than uh coming up with solutions uh but ultimately um bringing things down to a local level bringing things down um democratically is is the way that we think things should and could be handled you know i, I guess it's key then to to emphasize as you sort of already have but i'm sure you want to comment on it more that people shouldn't be reading this manifesto really in a in a left wing or right wing or even a political way really it's a it's sort of uh a system to allow a locality to grow yeah it's um it's really loose the the book isn't you know you can't go into it with a preconception of left wing right wing or anything else it's it's a collection of ideas uh which is sort of intending to inspire more of a world view a philosophy as opposed to really a very rigid political theory um, because of the flexibility of localism. You know, it's um, it's by design, not left or right wing, um, because that's the very intention with which we wrote it. Um, you know, for example, you might support the NHS. You know, that doesn't make you a socialist. It's, it's these, you know, sort of malleable ideas which we've sort of all put together to form this greater idea of localism that, that really makes it what it is. Um, you know, I think a lot of the focusing on, on this left-right dichotomy um, it really prevents and stunts a lot of, of political evolution and discussion. Um, it's, it's a sort of Cold War relic of these sort of two conflicting sides of, of ideology, um, which prevents us looking sort of across the pond at what benefits might be on the other side. And, you know, by opening the worldview up more, by looking, you know, and reading... Um, the literature from all over the world and from all sorts of different worldviews and perspectives and under different ideologies and, and for and against different ideologies, you can start to sort of really um, define localism as something separately. And, and that's what we did. I mean, if you, you think back to even, you know, the ancient Greeks, uh, you know, you wouldn't define Athens or Sparta as 
left or right wing. Um, and if you did, you'd probably be quite disingenuous in doing so. I mean, the, the systems in that sense were organic. Um, so it's it's definitely, um, I think, more of a worldview. And the book is really trying to build that rather than trying to build some sort of very concrete, definite um, sort of ideology, some, such as something like the Communist Manifesto might have been doing. Yeah, it definitely goes beyond that. And we look at more um, centralization versus decentralization being the real question of our era and democracy versus the lack of democracy that we currently have. So I often joke as well that it's uh, the deserved sequel to the English Civil War. We're finally getting the democracy that we should have got after the Civil War. Hmm, okay, okay. I would sort of bring that down to another abstract level um, in terms of how can you stop then that idea that you know isn't left or right the idea that you're talking about in the book how can you stop that being appropriated by certain movements you know we're seeing it a lot with the left with yeah. um acid corbinism and you know sort of memifying their politics as to appeal and to reappropriate in some sort of popular sense and i mean i think you see this with a lot of these kind of movements that you suddenly see you know, and I mean, I made the mis- you you pointed out, Patrick, that I made the mistake at the start to say that I came from a rural background in thinking, you know, subsuming leftism, uh, localism into that um, sort of nostalgic frame of rural life. Whereas, that, of course, you could have an urban or even a suburban locality. So, how do you stop it being reappropriated by the you know by people who sort of want to use up this idea? So. For, for me, again, and, and a lot of it will always come back to this, but it is the direct form of democracy. It's the reinvigoration of the community and the community's values through tangible action and control of their lives. So if you look at the likes of Kurt Cobain being taken by the capitalists and packaged and sold, whatever he did to rebel, it was packaged and sold. Even when he killed himself over it, that was packaged and sold as part of his lifestyle. Um, so... Very much so, these things, though, have been controlled again, top down. It was record labels above him. It was the capitalist system above that. And it was free markets worldwide for music above that. So ultimately, what we're saying is citizens' assemblies, again, will offer agency to communities and reinvigorate the community spirit and cooperation, which allows the core principles of localism to cement themselves. So that being obviously control of politics um, on its most tangible possible level for people. Um So once communities do have the reins, we think they'll begin to reassess their presumed default. Um, Margaret Thatcher said a long time ago about sort of neoliberal worldview, she said there is no other way. Well, that's kind of how we feel about localism. There is no other way. And people are waking up largely to climate crisis. You know, that's why things like Seaspiracy are very big right now. People are aware of what's going on in the crisis that face them. They just feel that they can't do anything about it. But with a return and an option to do something about it. I think that's the very way in which you stop modernity or capitalism from reappropriating your system because you have control of it, not the capitalist. You're not going to get a capitalist on the smallest level. Trevor, who's voting down the road, isn't going to be taking control from the from the bottom to somehow to instantly go from the top down. Yeah, and I think even looking at it from a sense of the ideas being reappro- uh, reappropriated before their actual implementation as well, you can really see that, um, you know, localism is is flexible, at least in the sense that it can be, um, you know, you can appreciate it from multiple different perspectives, be it your prioritization being that of the value of communities, be it, um, you know, disdain for capitalism and, and the effects thereof. Um, you know, it, it is an ideology which I think, you know, I'm really open to people sort of putting at least to a certain extent their own spins on and their own interpretations of. I mean, we, we talk in the start of the book about how, you know, if you are a foreign reader, we want you to interpret localism and this book in your own way and apply the ideas and the discussion we've had and culminated in that book to your own setting. And really, I'm not particularly worried that localism will be um, turned into something that's not because ultimately it is itself um you know from from the bottom to the top uh you know a self-fulfilling prophecy it is what it is and it is you know anti-capitalist and anti-modernity um so it's and you know as much as you might see Karl Marx Funko Pops I think hmm. there is a ability for capitalism to often utilize an ideology for its own benefit uh but I think even now you can't really argue that communism itself has become capitalist um 
at least not in in, a, in an ideological sense it still is communism how capitalist you know state capitalism is or whatever is is another topic but you know the ideas themselves haven't really changed by capitalism cat- sorry capitalism's influence uh, but capitalism has sort of co-opted it into its bubble um and i, I think ultimately uh, localism will be able to escape from that simply by grasping onto those cemented principles of direct democracy, citizen assemblies, things like that, which which will come as localism sort of makes itself more tangible, which is something that's that's very quickly starting to happen all across the world. And definitely in England as well, there's a lot more push for direct democracy and citizen assemblies, things like that. And and as these things become more prolific, it will be a lot easier for people to hold on to these ideas and really uh, stop them from from escaping us. Okay, okay. I mean, so there's this big emphasis on direct d- direct democracy, which obviously is the the will of a, the collective, be it a smaller local collective. But of course, in that, as you say, each person becomes more of an individual, you know, uh, as they are under neoliberalism, even though that is neoliberalism's sort of aim is to make everyone, you know, the absolute individual, and that's mm-hmm. our absolute freedom. Um, and this is one of the sort of places I find... Um, you know, I, I'm not here to sort of pick pick your pick your thing apart, but this is like because I I do believe in it to a certain degree, but I see these sort of problems. And one is that I'm not sure that that sort of individual is is still around. I think if if you if a form of localism began to organically develop, and I'm not sure how that would happen without these individuals in the first place, I'm not sure too many people would really trust it because there has been years and years and years of complete reliance on globalized or nationalized you know state apparatus or corporation or yeah or corporations so you know do you do you i mean i'm i'm assuming you do but do you think that there is a possibility for the you know that that communal individual to actually be sort of born again yeah um yeah absolutely so one of the best examples very recently is in the town of Frome uh, in England. We've had uh, essentially independents have taken over the entire council. Uh, it took a couple of runnings, but 17 people took the seats. And since then, the turnout has been higher and higher and higher. And they ended up uh, in the second year with 70% approval um, as well from everyone in their local areas. And we've now got to the point where they've got crowds turning up. So it didn't take long for that kind of individual to rebirth, actually. And sometimes all you really have is this anecdotal evidence. You can't necessarily go through everything like it's a mathematical equation of how to get these things back. Um, it's certainly not. And But, but it has worked. It, that's the best case study we've got at present in England. Um, you can look at other parts of the world, but it's certainly uh, the most applicable one. So... For me, I just have personally a lot of faith that those people are still definitely out there and would definitely want to be more involved. And once they have that opportunity to get involved, they are. Um, You have to apply for an opportunity to speak there because so many people show up, but they've got applications going through the roof because everyone wants to have their say. And now that they've learned they can and they've got locals in control, uh, they've got people who actually care what's going on in their area. And I think that's really resonated with the people. Yeah, I think I think Seth really uh, hit the nail on the head there. I think From is is a fantastic example of it uh, in action, and I think ultimately um, a model that other uh, regions around the country can follow. Um, but no, it, it is not painting by numbers and and rebirthing any sort of um, community spirit is something that's going to depend on any individual and what you know they sort of see as as their community and the community itself as well, um, and, and a thousand other factors. So we don't have a very simple step by step how to, you know, change this sort of cultural attitude, because, you know, that's beyond the realms of theory, really. You know, you can only see these cultural shifts in practice. Um, but we know we do believe that that ultimately it sounds like from, uh, you know, the the introduction of democracy into a workplace, all these feelings of agency, which we can return to people, be it through, you know, economics or through democracy politically. Um, the, this sense of agency will be what brings that community spirit out of people because so many people, and we talk about this in the book, are feeling as if they have a lack of purpose, uh, feel as if they have a lack of control over their lives. By reopening those doors for people to actually have that impact, um, I think a lot of people will leap at the opportunity because it's something that I think is lacking in people and people are aware of that, roughly. Yeah, I mean, you'd see a lot of people talking about the lack of community spirit. Um, 
but ultimately they just need that opportunity to be able to pull it back out of themselves. I think it is within everybody. We are, you know, communal animals. We we thrive on it. So I think it's under a local system only a matter of time for those attitudes to change. Also, it's within living memory for a lot of the elderly. That's what I find intriguing. Um, things like our police, our healthcare, all of our policies have only been centralised for a short time, really. Um, and they did used to be in the hands of local people. If you look at the cottage hospitals that all got shut down as well, um, it's a prime example. But um, for me, a big part of that is that has taken away responsibility from people. And I think responsibility is a key part of this. And once responsibility is implemented back to people for things that they know full well, they used to control and can control again. Um, I think it's that control of that that will help massively because they will see how all of these things interconnect. Once more responsibility is on the local community to uphold one another, they do see how it connects. Just as a small example, again, it's anecdotal, but uh, where I'm from is very much rural Suffolk. And um, we have always had to take care of our own and we've had one homeless person really in the whole time we've been there it's a very affluent area to be fair but they were always taken care of it was the local cafe fed them every single day um, while they waited for council housing and then equally someone had them every single night the entire time so that sense of community very much is there people are willing to help it's in a smaller system that this works though the larger systems the bloated systems the cities are the ones that struggle with these things um, and that's not to say to do away with cities, but it is to break up cities into smaller municipalities that can handle it on a human scale that people can actually understand and can feasibly control themselves because people aren't stupid. And I think it's a key part of our theory as well is that we want to reinvigorate people because we know that they can. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, I would just state that I, I'm having this conversation. You guys are have a have an energy of optimism uh, which I don't think I'll ever, <laughs> you know, I, I wish the cause well, but I'm just more pessimistic. I, I uh, um, <laughs> Perhaps I won't go into that. But um, one thing, you know, I would bring in is the idea of this responsibility and consumer habits. And I just wonder, you know, as you did say, you do make the case and I'm completely sort of kind of supportive of the anecdotal thing. I don't think everything needs to be, um, you know, like, oh, you need five different peer reviewed papers to, to prove that or whatever. You know, we can just speak to our great aunts and uncles and understand, you know, what the what the past was like. Um, and as you say, it has been in living memory that there was small towns which had responsibility, which generally changed things in their locality. But I wonder if enough time has passed that eventually people become subservient and you would have or even submissive in a way that you would just have generations of people who wouldn't want to even take the responsibility, who actually are quite narcissistic, quite selfish. Um, so I think that's that's why I say you're optimistic, because I think you uh, you probably see humanity in a nicer, <laughs> clearly see humanity in a nicer light than myself. I think on smaller aggregates, people do naturally cooperate. I think we do come together on smaller aggregates. Um, I got quite annoyed recently listening to, um, not to be so rude about, but it was a far right talker on a podcast. So I won't say who it was um, because I don't want to sort of have an ad hominem attack, but they claimed that if you had 50 people of different races on a desert Island, they'd have such an in-group preference that they wouldn't work together. I utterly disagree. I think on a small enough aggregate, people would always work together. And I think that cooperation is very natural and I've seen it because doing what we do and doing our activism we do go to local communities and organize a little bit and that's exactly what i've seen everywhere i've gone i've seen a distaste for centralization and everywhere i've gone i've found the people who do write letters to change things i've found the people who do try to get active the people who will put a banner outside their own bedroom window that says no kfc here um so i think it absolutely is that that was quite a um to use a colloquial term, white pilling event for me, um, something that made me very happy to see and did give me a lot of faith because the reason I was laughing when you were talking about that was I've gone through very recently um, a period where for about two weeks I was really struggling uh, to be optimistic about it because um, it becomes a sort of reflexive impotence is what Mark Fisher calls it in Capitalist Realism. I know exactly what he means. It's this idea that eventually you feel that these things are too big, too out of your control, that you can't possibly fix them. And I very much took that route for a brief time um, until one line brought me back into the fight. 
because I sat there looking at the environmental crisis and I thought this is too big and there's too many large systems that are going to stand in our way of fixing it. And I was looking at political structures and how powerful they are and the various different ways in which they validify themselves. And that scared me. Um, and I, I genuinely did go down quite a dark route for about two weeks of being quite depressed about it, to be honest, like actually quite emotionally infect, affected by it. Um, but it was when Mark Fisher said, if you take this idea of a reflexive impotence where you just feel you can't do anything, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that one line dragged me back in where I was like, son of a bitch, he's right about that. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course, nothing's going to happen if you do look at it that way. So uh, I only sound so positive because you caught me at just the right time when <laughs> I've gone through that phase of worrying about it. But honestly, it's people and it is people that have changed me on that. Um, and I can get sick of people as much as anyone else can. But once you do get into the communities and get talking to people, you will realize how much of a taste there is for getting power back, how much of a taste there still is in the spirit of the diggers, how people do want to fight centralization because they can see the effects it's had on all of them. You know, it's many, many um, shops and local families are in the ruin of a local Tesco. So not everything that's local necessarily is localist. Mm. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll open the I'll open the floor because I'm sure to you both because I'm sure you'll have a lot to say on this. But you know, how can people uh, get involved? So, uh, well, obviously, we can uh, you know sort of promote ourselves here. Local Matters is an organisation which its entire purpose is really to uh, try and sort of shove the ideas of of localism itself down everyone's throat. Uh, you know, we want to try and spread the ideas. We want to try to popularize them. And we do that through a variety of um, community actions around the country, around England. So, you know, that's sort of the easiest way to get involved. And I could sit here and talk, you know, at length um, about local matters and the specifics of what we do. Um, but ultimately, it's it's more down to your own given situation, your own given specialities and the the needs of your own community. Um, localism is an idea which is best implemented and best spread by doing. You know, it's not communism. We're not asking you to seize the means of production. We're quite simply asking you to interact with the community and work to the benefit of your community. So, you know, if you do have, you know, any community projects going on, if you have any um, council meetings or anything like that, get involved with them. Talk to the people who are and see how you can contribute towards them. That's localism in practice. And that ultimately is, is what, you know, we are slowly working towards. You know, we as Local Matters, if you're listening to this podcast, you've already really, um, we've already really done our job because our job is to tell you what localism is. And then your job is to go and do it once you know it, that, it, you know, that it's a thing in the first place. It's, it's your job to implement it. It's your job to go and found that citizens assembly. Um, you know, and I think that the, the most important thing for people to really do is to just take the ideas, take what they're passionate about and run with it. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talking about, you know, people setting up their own ad hoc citizens assemblies and, and, and just leading things in their own community, putting, you know, your local GP in touch with your local school and getting them to come in and do a talk. And these things might seem so minute. And I think even when I was first getting into this sort of politics, I've been involved in uh, political discussions for a, for a long time before that and I sort of sat there and I thought this sounds so silly because when you come from a mindset of thinking about revolutions about wars about great political struggles about you know even great campaigns in terms of party politics and the great you know changes that some you know politicians like Thatcher has made for example you know it, it seems very strange to think on this very small, minute and, and face value sort of inconsequential level. But ultimately, it's it does come back to this sort of same argument that you'll often see our environmentalists use, although I think in this sort of context, it's a, it's a lot more practical. That being that, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. And it, it really will be the bedrock of localism at that point. You know, once you start having these communities function in isolation function on their own and be more independent that's where the ball starts turning and the, 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 there is that slow decline into a more localized system and then from there that's when you start to look at getting you know mps and councillors in place who can actually implement these systems and then bring out broader reforms and that's talking about things like federalization but ultimately the the way to get this started is to go and do it, to go be a part of your community, to get involved with the community, to shop local, uh, be local, and um, 
live local really um, but if you are interested in getting involved you go to the localists.org you can uh, join local matters as a supporter you can help us spread those ideas get involved with community actions we also do uh, far more exciting stuff you know dropping banners stuff like that so if if you are interested in getting involved get stuck in but ultimately to actually found localism itself in a tangible sense uh the the you know responsibility there is much more on your own shoulders and the shoulders of the people around you and we can help a lot if people do uh join directly as well we are always willing to help um we've got a lot of people who have read a lot we've got a lot of people who are brand new to it and just have a rough idea but know what they're after um so you know if you ever do join our chats or ask us questions on our social media so it's uh, at local matters eng is what we normally are on almost every platform um you can get in touch that way and we can help uh, we've got a lad joined a while ago um who's been writing articles on the obesity crisis and how the nhs is spending more on it than they're spending on smoking now uh, and the need to do something about this so he asked me after he'd written this great critique of it he then asked me you know can you write the other half of what localism thinks we should do about this so i did he read it over and he was like man there's some good ideas there and uh, that's where patrick was talking about talking to your gp and talking to your school because i said to him directly i said have you talked to your gp have you asked him if he'd be willing or her sorry uh, if they'd be willing to go to schools and talk about preventative uh, forms of healthcare, talk about what is a good diet, talk about why you don't get things that masquerade as food from the supermarket, why you don't get chemicalized foods, you know, what they should really be uh, having. And he said, well, you know, then what do I do? And I said, well, talk to the school, just go to the school, talk to them, write them a letter, send them this article if you want. And I said, talk to them, get a communication going there. And then after you've done all of that, contact the local paper, get it in the local paper and instantly it's change made and it's something they're going to want to pick up on as well because they're desperate for stories a lot of the time. And they're going to want to pick up on a consensus and doing that kind of thing to help. Uh, so yeah, it, it, we can always offer help and guidance as well. Okay. Um, you know, you guys have uh, been super ready for my questions, so this is this has been sort of quick. Um, is there anything you'd like to to add that you feel we've we've missed about localism that's key? Um, I I did want to go over a bit more on why we've sort of positioned ourselves against other uh, mobilizing ideologies. Mm -hmm. Um, so quite categorically we try to class ourselves outside of the dichotomy as we've said but also outside of the mobilizing ideologies of the 20th century so outside of communism outside of fascism because we have a few reasons for doing that um first of all we don't view those as ideologies capable of renewing themselves and largely it's because they tend to be controlled by the state top down and there tends to be a vanguard um in other words, for anyone who wouldn't know, a, a small group of people who say how it should be run uh, on behalf of the others. We very much believe in avoiding anything of that sort. And we think it's one of the few systems that won't have a vanguard. Um, so we position ourselves against them really, partly because of that, but we believe they've all put the state above the people. Um, and we we want England to move in the direction that it needs. And we know that that's going to require a lot of collective energy from people. And we know that needs to maneuver into the crisis of the 21st century in a very different way. Um, I read, I, I've read Communist Manifesto uh, a number of times and got some phenomenal critiques, of course, of capital. I read Oswald Mosley's book and, you know, it was so environmentally damaging. It's unreal because his entire ideology basically revolves around using the world's resources or using England's resources, which is something we now know we can't do. And this is just it. A lot of the mobilizing theories don't have answers for the AI war that we're going to be having for ecological crisis, automation, the necessity for more plant based diets or vegan farming and the subsidies that need to be given to farmers to make these things happen. And anyone who does say that they can be answered through it is largely talking about guesswork or again is engaging in a form of vanguardism we don't want that we want the people to shape their route forward and maneuver into the 21st century in the way they think is going to allow England to succeed in the new world okay um patrick is there anything you'd you'd like to add 
Yeah, I think um, not only has, has Seth made some fantastic points in their own right, but I, I do actually want to expand as well on um, sort of a running theme that we've made and that, you know, we do talk about being outside of that left-right dichotomy, but a big part of that is actually understanding, you know, both sides of, of the coin and not only that, but also um, seeing what, what we can actually learn from, you know, socialism, be it from liberalism and, and, and use the actual wisdom of those who came before us to, to really bring something new um, out into, into the fold, that being localism. It's, it's really about delineating from this very narrow minded idea of historical progression. And you can see that a lot in the ways in which we talk about um, Africa, the global south. Uh, or you know the so-called developing world in in the sort of belief that you know there is this you know liberal democracy which is somehow better than all of the systems and you know the the united states is going to come to your country and democratize you bring you a, a capitalist system x y and z and that is somehow some form of progression um you know it, it is all about understanding the differences throughout the world we talk about it as pluralism and understanding the ways in which different systems different peoples um and, and different environments be it uh, those quite physical now or those which might manifest themselves in the next 50 100 years um can really be tackled talked about discussed and, and eventually to a certain extent you know just be lived through because there's certain things which are out of our hands um so you know i i'm really passionate about looking beyond sort of anyone's individual um sort of echo chamber and i think you know we really got to where we're at with localism uh, and, and into writing the book as well by doing that and you know if if somebody doesn't come out of this talk as um a localist if someone's listened to this and think you know what i think these guys are crazy they're so over optimistic or this that or the other um i would at least encourage them to go and read not only our book which again you can find at our website, but at the very least, go read anything else they disagree with. See the other side of the coin, and at least then you understand the strengths of your opposition. Reinforce your own beliefs, and ultimately, probably learn something you didn't already know, because a lot of people live politics, breathe politics, but actually read very little politics, understand very little politics beyond what they might read online or see on the news. And that goes for not just people who are, um, you know, boomers who sit there and, and, you know, watch the BBC all day and just sort of consume whatever, you know, information is thrown at them. But it comes from, you know, very politically minded people in the 21st century. It comes from a lot of people who consider themselves very hardcore, very radical, um, who, who very much sort of entrap themselves in these uh, narrow-minded ideologies without really thinking about the greater implications or what the other people are doing. Um, so like I say, I, I really encourage everybody listening um, to really um, look out into the world and, and see the broader discussion of ideas that are happening there. And if, if you think that we're wrong, please tell us. We, we love to sit there and talk about localism all day. And I'm sure we've uh, rattled everyone's heads off uh, for long enough today about it. But um, you know, we we do actively on a day to day basis sit and discuss the intricacies of, you know, we, we, we even go into the level of, you know, what happens if some um, group of friends decide to start shifting bread between the counties because there's different bread taxes and things in a local system and all these different very minute hypothetical situations we love to get involved with. So if you want to talk to us... A great hydroponic or... debate of bananas. That was uh, one hell of oh. a debate for a whole night. <laughs> yeah, we were there for a long time on that that one sentence in the book. But either way, there's, uh, <laughs> a, lot, there's a lot to be uh, debated, discussed, and a lot of, of perceptions and perspectives that we, we love to take on board. And it's, it's been really great to be on this podcast and, and have you play devil's advocate a little bit because... Uh, it's it's nice to be tested and it's nice to sort of have the opportunity to um, be confident in what you're, you're talking about and be confident in, you, in your own ideas. Because if you can't speak to somebody else who doesn't agree with you, uh, even on a, a slight issue, then, you know, you, you can't really say you fully believe in what you're talking about or at least uh, you fully understand it. Yeah, uh, it's something I'd definitely like to leave on uh, is while communists and fascists uh, fight over sticker placement on lampposts and the larger system looks down upon them and laughs, one thing I, that really changed me and I, I really want to encourage people to just try for at least one week 
is look at every single issue you see in the news, look at every single issue you see locally or internationally, and always consider scale and think, is scale the problem? And if you look at recent events, such as the ship blocking the Suez, it, sh it literally blocked it because they made it too big. Look almost anywhere in the world and you will find that the problem almost always comes down to bigness. Something is almost always too big if something is wrong. So I would yeah, really like to encourage people to look through the lens of bigness and think, would something smaller work better there? Is it better to be a large obese system filled with ailments or is it better to be lean, slim and fast moving? Sounds good. I mean, and so this can be found on, is it localmatters.org? It's thelocalists.org the and then the book is uh, slash manifesto. And what other sort of texts do you guys have on there at the moment? Uh, it's it's um, the only book we've got published at the minute. We're talking about maybe doing um, additional texts surrounding uh, more specifics that we touched on in the book. So having one focus on economics and stuff like that. But um at the minute, that's that's all we got on there. Unless a lot of articles, sort of. Uh, yeah, there's lots of articles and other stuff to read, but uh, in terms of actual physical books, you can buy. That's that's the only one at the minute. Okay. Um, yeah, that seems like a, a good place to finish up. Uh, Seth and Patrick, thanks very much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much.